All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here this morning. It's always great to hear lots of chatter going on in this room. Hey, my name's Justin. I'm the high school pastor here at Faith E. And I don't know if I'm the only one, but anyone else recovering from a little cold over the last couple weeks here? Okay. We're in this together, right? So if you notice a little extra sniffling or some extra water breaks, that's, that's the reason why. But we still want to bring God's word to y'all this morning. So that's why I'm here. So very excited. We're in the gospel of Mark and we're going to dive right into things this morning. So if you have your Bible, you can grab those. Uh, or if you have one of our scripture journals through the Gospel of Mark, I encourage you to grab one of those too. We should have some extras on your way out if you would like one throughout this series. Um, those journals are a great, great opportunity just to, one, get into scripture in a different way. So we have the OIA study method in there, and that's a great option to just take your Bible reading time and enhance it even more, uh, truly study the scripture as it, as it is, um, and also gives you some other practical things you can do throughout the week to stay in scripture and be in touch with what we're talking about here through our series, through the Gospel of Mark. And today is a special day because we are officially in chapter two of Mark. So we made it. We're here. We're in chapter two. Slow and steady wins the race, and so uh, we're going we're gonna to have quite a bit to talk about this morning. So here's how I'd like to do this. Uh, I'm going to read the passage as a whole. We'll read that all together. You can follow along with me in your journals and your Bibles. It'll be up on the screen. Uh, we're going to read it as a whole, and then we're going to break it apart into some bite-sized pieces this morning. So let's go ahead and do that. Mark chapter 2, verse 1. We've got 12 verses to read, um, and let's, let's see what God has to say to us this morning. It says, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. So some men bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them, since they could not get to him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking such things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And so he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. So he got up, took his mat, walked out in full view of them all, and this amazed everyone. And they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Before we get into the bite-sized chunks this morning of our message, I, I want to address just the story as a whole. I think it's always, it's fun to take time when reading scripture and kind of put yourself into the story, right? Because what's amazing about the stories we read here through scripture, they're, they're things that really happened. And I like to think about what it would have been like to be someone in the audience you're excited to see Jesus. It's clear that he's making an impact. He's kind of a celebrity, so to speak, building up popularity, and people want to go see him. And so you show up early, right? You actually get your family out of the house before you need to leave for church in the morning, right? And you're like, hey, we're doing good. We got a good seat. We're ready to see Jesus. And he starts teaching, and then all of a sudden, a hole is cut in the roof, and these four men are scarily lowering somebody on a, a paralyzed man on a mat right at the base of Jesus. Talk about distraction, right? <laughs> Talk about sidebar, like what is going on while I'm trying to listen to this message, this word of Jesus. And I just thought, one, well, one, I asked if we could cut a hole in the ceiling here at church, but that idea got nixed. So we can't really fully relive that experience this morning, but... I did think there's a lot of times, especially in church on a Sunday morning, where there are distractions, where there are interruptions, and those interruptions most often to us feel like they're things that deter us 
from experiencing Jesus. But in this story, the interruption actually brought people closer to Jesus. Right? It gave them an opportunity to see who Jesus was and what he was trying to do with this sermon, with this experience that we're going to read through. And so here's what I want to ask before we even get into anything this morning. Will you, with me, have a posture this morning to say, Lord, will you interrupt what's going on in my life right now for the, for the better? You know, maybe you showed up here this morning at church expecting, hoping to hear or see or have whatever that experience might be for you. And Jesus might say, hey, I've actually got something different I want to put on your heart this morning. A lot of us here are probably thinking, hey, there's a lot to do, myself included, right? As soon as church is over, there's things I got to get done, tasks I got to get taken care of so I can start Monday off in the week ready to roll. But can you just this morning say, Jesus, will you just interrupt my normal rhythm of life so I can hear you? Will you shake up our faith? Will you just prepare us to hear your word in a unique way this morning? And I think just with that, I want to actually start us off officially with prayer this morning and just have that posture. Hey, God, will you interrupt us in just a beautiful way so we can hear your voice? Will you do that with me? Will you pray with me before we get into our, our message this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for stories like this. For some of us here, we've probably heard this story multiple times even, but God, we know you can... You can reveal new things to us. We just have to be present and be willing to let you do that. Uh, and so this morning, um, I'm sure there will even be distractions in the message today. Can we put those aside and can we let you really grab our heart, grab our attention? Uh, can we hear your voice? I know every one of us here has something unique that you are trying to share with us. And so can we be open to your voice, Lord? So we love you. We thank you. and We pray this in your name. Amen. Alrighty, so we're going to, like I said, break this into some bite-sized pieces. So if you have your Bible or you have your journal, you can kind of follow along, take some notes in your bulletin too. You'll see we're going to hit kind of three main points today of how I think the passage is kind of laid out. There's a lot more in the middle of all those points too. So you can follow along, but we'll start with the beginning, verses 1 and 2. And we see this a few days later. We just read, but let's, let's revisit. A few days later when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. So what's kind of cool, we're entering into chapter two. So Jesus has been building up his ministry, so to speak. Right at this point, people know who he is, and we can see that, right? Uh, there's kind of a, a big church service happening at, we don't know if it's his house or Peter's house or one of the disciples' houses, but it's taking place in someone's home, and that home is filled, right? Some of you extroverts are like, that sounds like a great weekend to me. Like, let's get people over and have a party and hang out, and we can talk. And then others of us introverts are like, that just sounds like a lot of work and a lot of cleaning once everybody's gone, right? But this is a good kind of excitement. This is a good kind of pack that's taking place in this story because people are just desperate to go see Jesus. You know, it's like if you fill in the blank for whatever celebrity or pop star, or whoever you follow on social media or you, you love that's an icon, like if they were to come here to Billings, Montana, you would be like, this is my number one person. I'm gonna take some time off of work I'm going to change my schedule and do whatever it takes just to be in that person's presence. And so that's kind of what's happening here with Jesus. People want to see him. People want to be in his presence. His ministry was growing, and it's interesting because his ministry is growing not just because of the miracles, it seems, but people want to hear what he has to say. So it's exciting. There's a lot of stuff happening. The ministry of Jesus is, is escalating. You could say his ministry was through the roof, so to speak, right? Thank you. I was going to insert a laugh track if you guys didn't laugh there, so thank you. I had to say that at least once, right? But there's some excitement going on, and I want us to make sure we recognize that. And what happens in the next section we're going to see here in just a minute is people are willing to go beyond just being in the presence of Jesus. They're willing to do whatever it takes 
to see him and to hear him. So enter a new character, a couple new characters in verses three and four, we see this. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. So again, talk about distraction. I right? talk about willing to do whatever it takes to get into the presence of Jesus. We have these new characters that are brought onto the scene, these four men and this paralyzed man. And it seems like they kind of devised a plan, right? I'm assuming, so you don't usually show up somewhere assuming you're going to get there through the roof of the building. But these men show up to the building of the house where Jesus is preaching at. And just to give you a little context or a little visual of what this would have looked like, most houses in that area of Capernaum and and of that time uh, were pretty standard, simple houses. They, most of them had like, uh, excuse me, stairs or access to get to the top of the roof. So these men actually probably thought through this thinking, hey, this is an easy way. Let's just drop this guy through the roof. Not the safest way, but an easy way, right? And so the roofs of the buildings back then, uh, I think I even have a photo we can show here. The roofs were kind of made of a couple different types of material, but they're not the typical roof we would see today, thankfully, right? Winters here would be pretty rough if that's what our roofs look like. But they're accessible, right? You've got some different types of materials, some beams there. Uh, You've got typically like straw or hay or some other type of material to kind of cover the top of the roof. And so these men, they're climbing up to the top of the roof. They're determined. They've probably had to bring some sort of tool or something to kind of dig a hole and cut through the material there and the debris. And, And I just can only imagine in the middle of this message, all of a sudden this hole bursts open through the roof. And then a man gets lowered down to the feet of Jesus. And you gotta, you gotta give these guys credit. They're doing whatever it takes to see Jesus. And there's a lot of things, probably most of us here would say, hey, I'm, I'm willing to drop a lot of stuff in my life to go see this person or to go be a part of this experience. But when it comes to our relationship with Jesus, man, are we willing to go through the roof to be in his presence? We'll talk about this in a little bit, but man, the, the men who took the paralyzed man to see Jesus, they could have very easily just saw the crowd and said, today's probably not the best day. But they were willing to go above and beyond. They were committed and they wanted to be in his presence. And so if you're taking notes this morning, here's something I see in this passage that I think is really important. And maybe it sounds cliche or something we've heard before in church but it's a reminder to relentlessly run towards Jesus. And I love that word relentless because it's more than just saying, come to church on Sunday and open your Bible, tell someone you're praying for him and then you're, you're good. Relentlessly running to Jesus is saying, I don't care what's in the way, I'm gonna make Jesus happen today. So I'd ask you a follow-up question with, with this statement here. And you, if you want to take notes, you can maybe write this down too, I guess. But man, is there anything that's in between you and Jesus right now? Like, is there a crowd, so to speak, that's either prohibiting you or making it more difficult for you to get into the presence of Jesus? Could be a job. Could be something that keeps your calendar full all the time, and so it's just really difficult to say, hey, I I can't make time for Jesus. It could just be life circumstance. Sometimes when life gets really difficult and we're dealing with a lot, we kind of use that as a time to say, I can put a few things on pause, but we can't put our relationship with Jesus on pause. If anything, we should want more and more to be in the presence of Jesus. I love Psalm chapter 27. It's one of my favorite psalms in scripture. And it just talks about this idea of one thing the psalmist desires is to be in the presence of God. But in verses seven to eight, he says this, hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. What cool imagery 
to think about, hey, God, I don't want to just feel you here and read you here. I, I want to be in your presence with whatever I can do in whatever way I can make happen. And so my challenge to you with this first point here is, yes, relentlessly run towards Jesus, but know that sometimes that can look like taking it one step at a time. And this happens, the beauty of this is this happens in every phase of our relationship with Jesus. Whether you're new to the faith or you've been a part of a relationship with Jesus for your whole life, you know there gets these points in your life where you realize, man, that passion's not quite there right now. So sometimes it just means take a step closer to him. So that could look like putting him in your calendar. I know it's a weird thing to say, but that's something I found to be really helpful is to say, I'm gonna actually put when I wake up and study in my calendar. Now, does it happen every day? Not exactly. But I'm trying to prioritize that, right? I'm taking a step towards that. Maybe you need to remove one thing in your life. You need to have a sit down conversation with you and your spouse or you and God and say, God, what's in the way? Start and end your day with him. Pray to him for more than just a few minutes. See what you can do to seek his face and take one step closer to him. Because man, in this passage here, all I can see is a group of men that are saying, I will do whatever it takes to be in the presence of God. So I hope we can too. But there's a reason why these men want to be in the presence of God. Right? There's a reason why they're pursuing him. It's not just to be there, it's to hear his voice, it's to experience healing, and that's what happens next in verse five. So if you want, you can follow along with me here. We'll read a couple more verses, or we'll do just verse five for a sec. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. And what I want you to think about at this point in the story is what Jesus forgave first or what Jesus healed first. Because we've put ourselves in the scenario, right, of what this would look like. These men are committing everything they can to get this guy in the presence of Jesus. They lower him down. Jesus recognizes their faith, like he says in verse five. And then what he doesn't say first is, you are healed of your paralysis. Take your mat, get up and walk. No, he actually says your sins are forgiven. And part of me kind of thinks that the four guys that put in all this work would have been kind of like a little frustrated by that almost. Like, come on, man, we brought you all the way to Jesus and this is what you're gonna do? How do we even know you can forgive sins at this point? But Jesus, I think and I believe what he's doing here is showing us the importance of forgiveness when it comes to healing and he he's kind of saying the inner healing needs to take place before the outer healing really happens. And often, we're really focused on the outer healing. But Jesus forgives the sin of the man first, and look at how the rest of the people respond. Verse six and seven. It says, now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, I'm going to give these guys a little credit here because most often in the New Testament, we, we kind of start to get frustrated with the religious people because they're just always doubting. They're always trying to be finding some sort of flaw in Jesus. But we got to remember here, this is early in Jesus' ministry. And he's a man who's new to the scene, and now all of a sudden he's claiming that he can forgive the sins of other people. And now God's people knew that their Messiah was coming. They knew that their king at some point would return again, but they were a little more expecting someone to come in and reign like a king would come, right? To come wipe out their enemies, to come take over land that had been taken from God's people. But instead, this guy says he's the son of God and that he can heal and forgive sins. So we'll give him a little credit to ask that question, right? Because they're curious. But man, we have to be careful at the same time when we start to doubt who Jesus says he is. We have to make sure, man, when it comes to healing and forgiveness, do we really believe Jesus is who he says he is. 
Because what Jesus does in this section of scripture is he shows us not only his authority, he not only explains to the crowds and to us reading today that he's capable of forgiving sins, but he shows that no one can experience healing and forgiveness except through him. I want to read the last section of this, and we'll kind of land on our second point here. But to finish the story, these men questioned Jesus, and this would kind of freak me out a little bit, but verse 8, it says, immediately Jesus knew in his spirit this was what they were thinking, what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? But I want you to know, and this is what we were just saying, I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And so he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Then as the story ends, he got up, he took his mat, he walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. So Jesus shows us he's got authority to heal and forgive sin. He shows us the importance of saying forgiveness really is the more important thing when it comes to forgiveness inside our hearts to the other struggles that we're dealing on the outside. And I think a lot of times we are so focused on the healing part of Jesus. We're coming to him for the miracles, or maybe not even the miracles, but we're coming to him for the outer change. Hey, God, in my life right now, we are struggling financially, so can you help bring more income into our house, whatever that looks like? You know, hey, God, my job right now is difficult, and I work with people who aren't believers, and it's wearing me out. Hey, God, our family's going through this struggle right now. We don't know what to do. Those are good prayers. They're good things to approach Jesus with, but I think the greater miracle is not when Jesus helps the outer struggle, but when he fixes the inner problem in ourselves. A commentator um, on this passage expressed this idea of forgiveness by saying this, forgiveness is the greatest miracle that Jesus ever performs. It meets the greatest need, it costs the greatest price, and it brings the greatest blessing and the most lasting results. So Jesus knew this is where it starts. And we have to approach Jesus with the same mindset. So if you're taking notes, here's what I'd encourage you with. Forgiveness and healing are, inter are interrelated. They go together. Now, I'm not here saying that every time we are struggling with suffering on the outside, that it's a reflection of our heart on the inside. Sometimes those go together. We see, we've seen that to be true in scripture, but often they are connected. And so here's what I mean by this is, man, as we seek to be in a relationship with Jesus, are we stopping and asking ourselves, God, will you help fix this problem? Or are we stopping and saying, God, will you just fix me first? Will you work on my heart? Psalm 139, 23 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is anything, or if, see if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So here's what I would ask you with the second point, something to think about, is where in your life do you need forgiveness? Where do you need Jesus to step in and say, I know you think you need this problem fixed right now, but let's get to the deeper rooted issue. Uh, a, some song lyrics from a band I, I enjoy. Uh, they have a song called Poison Tree. They're kind of a Christian band, and they have lyrics, obviously, that reflect what our relationship with Christ looks like. And I love the lyrics to this song and to the chorus specifically. It talks exactly about what I think is happening here. It says, come and dig me up, reach down to the roots. Rip the deadness out and plant something new. I am alive. I will abide in the life-giving blood of Christ. I'm grafted in. You've killed my sin. Now I can live. I'll live in him. You can't really fix an issue on the outside until you fix the inside issue. 
Growing up in uh, high school, this is a fun fact I get to tell people, I probably had six or eight different cars throughout my whole high school time frame because I bought cheap cars and I thought they were easy to fix, but every time I thought I would fix the issue, ended up being something that was way more complicated and way more serious. Right, just because your car is steering right doesn't mean you need a new steering wheel. It means there's probably something deeper in the car that needs to be fixed. But so often we try to patch that up. And so in this story, Jesus models for us the importance of going to him for forgiveness. So ask yourself again, man, where do I need forgiveness? But I want to close with this this morning because all of this is very important, and it's all stuff we see that takes place in chapter two of Mark, but what stands out to me, probably more than anything, is the fact that none of this would have took place if this paralyzed man didn't have those people carrying him to Jesus. Like I said earlier, could you imagine if the paralyzed man and his friends showed up He's excited to see Jesus for the first time. And they see a crowd and they said, it's probably not gonna work out today, man, but we'll pray for you and we'll let you know how it goes. That'd be tough. And he wouldn't have seen Jesus. He wouldn't have experienced the healing and the forgiveness. And it's important that we see this part of the story because, man, if we think we can follow Jesus on our own, we are going to be lost. We are going to struggle. We're going to have moments where we need people to pick us up. And man, if you are a follower of Jesus or not, I hope you know this morning that you cannot follow Jesus on your own. You need people. And that's a good thing. But we're not always great at it. I think of how humbling it would have been to be the paralyzed man, to find four people to say, hey, will you carry me across town so everybody can see what I'm dealing with and that I can't walk, and then will you lift me up onto this roof, cut a hole, and drop me down? Like, that takes really trusting some people. That takes being honest and humble with somebody. And... I will say this, it's, it's a scary thing to realize, but it happens. Even in an amazing place like this church here, we can be surrounded with awesome godly people and still feel like we don't have people carrying our mat. So we need those people. Look at the verbiage that's spewed all throughout this chapter. It's not about him, it's they, right? They gathered in large numbers and crowds to see Jesus They, the four people, could not get the man to Jesus. They brought him to Jesus. They lowered the man to Jesus. And Jesus saw not his faith, but their faith. And when you think about that, that's pretty powerful to think about how your faith could impact somebody else's. Again, commentator mentioned in this passage specifically, these men didn't just say, hey, we hope the best for you. Let's pray and see how it goes. They said, they didn't just pray for their friend. They put feet to their prayer. And I think that's the kind of relationship and community we should have when we are coming together for Christ. So I'm gonna leave you with this. I got a few final things to share with you, but I wanna leave your your third point with this. You need to find people who carry you closer to Christ. You need people that are willing to answer the phone in the middle of the night and say, I'm here for you, I'll be there any minute. You just, you can't do it on your own. I know when me and my wife moved out here, man, that was a hard move for us because we left a place where we had grown up and built community and had people and friends that were with us through the good, the bad, and the ugly, but... We knew when we got here, the first thing we needed to make sure took place, we gotta find people. For us as a marriage, but also for us individually. And what's really cool is, man, there are people, (laughs) there are people in this room that took that role for me, that I know I could call them, I could text them, I could let them know I need you here right now and they drop everything they're doing. 
And if we don't have those people in our lives, man, we're gonna be, we're gonna be stuck on the mat and we're not gonna get to see Jesus. So what does this look like? How can we help other people carry their mat, so to speak? I got a video I wanna show you guys really quick so you can gaze your attention to the screen and we'll see what that could look like. That doesn't give you a good idea of what it looks like to truly carry somebody closer. I, I don't know what does. When we're so helpless and so desperate and so ne- in need of a relationship with Jesus, you need people like Rick Hoyt there who is willing to say, I'm gonna take you where you need to be. And we're all broken and helpless souls who are in need of Christ and sometimes the only way to get closer to Christ is to have other people carry you there. So I'm gonna leave you with this this morning. Who is, who is carrying your mat, so to speak? And you'll see even on your bulletin, there's a section at the very bottom where there's four lines for you to put four names. You can put your name in the middle if you want. Just help visualize, hey, this is, these are the people who are surrounding me right now who will take me where I need to go. And, and I wanna encourage you too to say, if you can't feel that, you're in the right place you should start looking for those people. You need to be in community. You need to be around other people who bring you closer to Christ. And so I wanna challenge and encourage all of you to think about what that looks like, who those people might be. Maybe you are that person for somebody else too, and it's been too long since you've reached out to someone to check in on them. But I'll say this, man, at Faithy, at any church, what's a beautiful part of being a follower of Christ is we're a part of a big community that cares and loves for each other. And so if you're looking for that community, I hope you know it's here. I hope you know there are people here that want to be involved in your life. And something beautiful that's happened in me and my wife's life recently is we did. We jumped into a small group about a month and a half ago because we knew it was that time for us to dig deeper to be more real with people about what's going on in our life and our marriage, and it's been life-changing for us. And so maybe that's you. Maybe you need to be a part of a small group. And like you've, like you've heard a couple times this morning, there's lots of ways to do that. Fill a connection card out. Just come talk to a pastor after service. But for other of you guys, if you are a part of a group, or if 
if you have community, I do want to encourage you to really ask yourself, are you letting other people carry you right now? Are you being honest and real? Because that's what those types of relationships require. So think about those people. And what we're going to do to kind of conclude our, our sermon, so to speak, this morning is we're going to end in a time of worship. So I'm going to invite the band actually to come join me up on stage. And we're going to sing one final song. And during this song, um, I just think it's very special and powerful when we end our time in the presence of God. And we've been in his presence all morning, but man, this story that we read talks all about people desperately wanting to be in the presence of God. But there's no other person worth worshiping and responding to. And so during this song, I'm gonna encourage you with a couple things. If this morning what you heard is, hey, I need healing and forgiveness, you know you can find that in Christ. So take some time to listen to the words, to reflect, and give those things to Christ. And if this morning you're convicted to think, hey, I need people in my life, we just take some time to say, God, will you reveal who those people are? If they're here, you can go find them. Put your hand on them and pray with them. But I like starting how we ended and the way this verse and story started was people just wanted to desperately see Jesus. And so I'm hoping this morning we can end wanting nothing else but to be in his presence. So will you pray for me and we'll sing this last song together. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning asking that you would be the one thing we desire. Where there is healing and forgiveness needed in our lives, would you reveal it to us? And Lord, if it's your will, would you help bring the people in our life, help them bring us closer to you? Can we not do this life alone? We need you and we need others. And so God, as we spend this time in response to what you're doing in our life, can we see you, feel you, experience you, and say thank you, God, for not letting us do this alone. We love you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Let's sing together.
Close your eyes, we can pray one more time together. I did want to give a chance for anyone that's here today, man, as we sing those words, you've not experienced what it's like to have one desire in your life be Jesus. You've been doing life alone and you want to be a part of a community. You want to be a part of a group of people and follow a God who carries and forgives the sin that weighs you down. And man, if that's you this morning, um, eyes are closed right now, but would you just mind popping a hand up really quick just so we can pray for you, know who you are. If that's you, just, yeah, a quick hand raise. Let us know. Awesome. If there's anyone else, I'll give you a moment to think and process, but God is good. And this passage is a reminder of for all of us this morning, man, when we pursue Jesus and when we let other people carry us closer to him, he heals and forgives our sin, and we're so, so thankful for that. So let's pray. Lord, we are thankful. I, I thank you even for, the, for those that raised their hand this morning, choosing to make that commitment to you, Lord. What a blessing. What an exciting opportunity to step into a relationship it's not lonesome, but is healing and renewing. And Lord, we are thankful, all of us here this morning, to be a part of a community that is centered on you. And so as we go this week, Lord, can we not do this alone? We love you, God. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Hey, before you all leave, again, thank you for being here. If you're one of the few um, that, that raised your hand, first of all, I did see a few hands, so can we give a round of applause? Isn't that awesome? Yeah. 
If that was you this morning, would you mind just filling out a Connect card, letting us know? We'd love to follow up with you and just give you some next steps going forward. The rest of you, man, I would encourage you, take that bulletin home with you. Find those four people. Reach out to them this week. Be a part of a relationship that carries you closer to God. And speaking of, we've got a few things in the lobby on your way out, some food and snacks. So grab a snack, shake someone's hand again, say hello to them, and let's live together. Thank you for being here. We'll see you all next Sunday as we continue in Mark. God bless.